What is up, everybody? It is a Monday night, and you'll notice I've got not Coach with me, but somebody different. We'll introduce him in a second. But first, tonight's topics, we're going to talk about what the last six Super Bowl champions have in common. We're going to get you fully prepared for the draft and the way that it's gone at the picks that the 49ers have this upcoming draft. Plus, we have a few other topics as far as future-proofing the San Francisco 49ers. How do we make sure that they remain good in 2025 and beyond? We're going to talk about all of those things, plus more, next. All right, welcome back to Last Second Sports, where we are giving you our take down to the last second. And you'll notice that usually Coach resides next to me on Mondays, but he's got some things going on. So I brought in the closer, Mr. Rohan. Rohan, what's going on, my man? Hey, Jesse, how you doing? I mean, obviously, fun Monday night here. Got to be on the show with you. Get to see that, you know, that old beard that continues to grow, little gray hairs and stuff. Uh, as always, appreciate coming on. Absolutely. Man, it's it's been a while. I, have we streamed since training camp? I feel like we have maybe once or twice. Maybe but, once, yeah. Uh, once or yeah. twice. But yeah, no, been a minute. Um, I mean, I needed a personal break. So <laughs> good to come back on, you know, uh, now in the dead period when nobody watches. Yeah, perfect. We don't want we don't want anybody thinking we're friends or anything. Yeah, That'd be weird. No, none we of that. Definitely don't want that. Did you uh are are you going to training camp again this year? Is that the plan? Plan right now. Yeah. Um, so we'll 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 definitely probably have to see you there again, you know. Um, but no, probably gonna be there back again this year. But you know, before training camp, we gotta see who's on the team uh in the first yeah, place. Dude, it starts with the draft. Be, training camps to be very different this year. I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, you're there. Uh, you were very helpful. We were trading notes back and forth, making sure that we were getting all the stats right so that we could deliver it going forward. But before we get there, obviously a lot of things have to happen. But one thing I was looking at yesterday, I was like, gosh, man, what what do Super Bowl winning teams have in common. I think a lot of times when I look at this in the past, I've looked at it and said, okay, well, yeah, the elite quarterback. Obviously, if you have an elite quarterback, that ups your chances. If you have an inexpensive quarterback, that helps. 49ers certainly fit into that category as far as inexpensive quarterbacks. So the window is wide open right now. But there were some other things. So I'm going to read these off to you, and you tell me if there's anything that surprises you. And maybe we'll go one by one and just see if the 49ers have somebody that fits all of their criteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the last six years, I believe the last six Super Bowl champs, obviously most of them have been either Tom Brady or Patrick Mahomes. We know they're elite. I think Matthew Stafford is also elite. So I put down that they all have an elite quarterback. Question number one is, is Brock Purdy elite now in your mind? And if not, do you believe he can reach that status this next year to help the 49ers win the Super Bowl? Yeah, I think this is obviously a subjective topic in terms of how sure. do you grade elite quarterback? Like, where do you kind of put that in? I think top 10 is where, uh, you know, if you crack the top 10, that's probably where you start to get in that range, maybe even closer to the top seven to top five. Personally, mm -hmm. do I believe Brock Purdy is elite right now? No. Do I believe he has the potential to? Yes. As you know, quarterbacks cycle in and out. You, you, you talked about some of the names, Tom Brady, Matthew Stafford, who've won Super Bowls in the last six years. Well, Brady's out of the league and Stafford is, you know, nearing his own retirement at some point in the near future. As you know, the new talent, as old talent recycles out and new talent comes in, that's where I think Brock Purdy with his ascension uh, as he continues to grow can potentially rejoin that range. Yeah, I also look at it and say, even if he's like, I, I look at Hall of Fame caliber and say that's elite, which is usually around that top six, top seven. I don't put him there yet, but what I can say is if he's top 10 and as cheap as he is, I feel like that closes the gap. So even if 49ers quote unquote don't have an elite quarterback because of the price and allowing them to build a team around him, I think he's close enough at his price to where you can say, yeah, it's elite enough. The two together makes it elite. And so you can win a Super Bowl with it. So, okay, I think we checked box number one. Box number two, all of these teams, not a Pro Bowl, very, very different. 
Pro Bowl and All Pro are, are different categories, but oh, yeah. all of these teams had an All Pro defender, at least one. In fact, three of them had two. So, do you believe the 49ers have a player on this team that can reach All Pro status this next year? I think this is probably, if you're talking about arguments, this is their best argument to make the Super Bowl. They have a roster comprised of a significant number of all pros. And you might not even, you might not want to view, you know, the past. You might want to kind of view how they could reach this year. If you just look on the offensive side of the ball, though, Christian McCaffrey will always be in that cate- uh, category year after year. Um, Trent Williams could be in that category. You could even make an argument for Brandon Ayuk and Brock Purdy to be in that category. That's four on the offensive side. Then you've got guys like Nick Bosa, Fred Warner potentially Javon Hargrave, and then a guy who's made it in the past. Um, you know, you can say what you want, but Tano Hufanga is a guy who's made it in the past alongside Trevor Swartz. So you've got eight to nine players who are in that conversation, which in itself is an impressive accomplishment. Yeah, well, it's all pro defender specifically. So mm-hmm. the way that I look at it, Bosa, obviously. I mean, not that Hargrave is, is necessarily getting... yeah younger but you know he could have an explosive season you never know i'm not ruling it out completely fred warner dre greenlaw if he's healthy hafunga's made it really i think demo or ward could make it as well so i think that they definitely have a player on this roster that can be all pro status so i think they check boxes one and two box number three this is not up for debate actually three four and five but we're going to discuss them box number three each of them had a head coach that has previously lost a Super Bowl. We checked that box. We checked that box because Shanahan has lost a Super Bowl. So we are good to go there. That's something that you. if you know that is true, that is the one thing that you know will be true. Exactly. So for all of you who say that Kyle Shanahan has lost Super Bowls, that means he can't win one. All of the previous coaches in the last six years that have won a Super Bowl have also lost a Super Bowl previously, although multiple of them had also won a Super Bowl previously. Okay, let's get to the next one. This one surprised me. Not one of these teams had a household name at running back. No elite running backs on any of these teams. They had players like Sony Michelle, Cam Akers, uh, Leonard Fournette, those types of players Isaac Pacheco, good players, more than serviceable, but not elite running backs. Do you believe that for any reason the 49ers having an elite running back takes them out of the possibly winning a Super Bowl category? I don't think so, but I also think this revolves around the number one thing you said, which is having an elite quarterback. Usually Mm. teams that have an elite quarterback don't have the necessity to pay an elite running back. The Niners, obviously, with a quarterback on a rookie contract, have kind of the luxury at the moment to pay a running back. And that's kind of the way that they're going. Obviously you're not going to say not having an elite player helps, but that's it. That's definitely an interesting trend. You know, Um, that is something to, to definitely look at over the last few years. Yeah. I think I also think what it comes down to is really the passing game over the last, last six years has taken over. It's not just the quarterback being elite, but these quarterbacks all pass a ton. Sometimes, you know, Tom Brady towards the end, maybe probably shouldn't been as been passing as much, (laughs) especially that last year. Maybe they should have relied on the running game a little bit more, but ultimately these guys all slung the ball around the yard, which makes it really interesting. So, you know, if Brock Purdy is going to reach that elite status, I think part of that does come with Kyle Shanahan trusting him a little bit more, allowing him to throw the ball around the yard a little bit more. You know, he was, I I think his season average was about six pass attempts under the league average per game, which is really, really low. So at least get him up into that league average category, maybe take a little bit off of Christian McCaffrey. And I think ultimately what this is telling us having an elite running back probably doesn't hurt, but relying on that elite running back over the quarterback Maybe that does hurt in winning a Super Bowl. Yeah. The last one is, oddly enough, none of these teams had an elite edge rusher. So same question with the running back. Do you believe having an elite edge rusher should take them out of this category? That's actually a really intriguing one. I hadn't thought about that one necessarily, but obviously having an elite player at the position doesn't hurt. But when you look at the complexion maybe of the last few winners, the Chiefs didn't have an elite edge rusher, but they had an elite D tackle. That was kind Mm -hmm. of the thing. And then they also had two good corners, right? So if you try and find where the heartbeat of their defense is, 
that's kind of the spot. The Chiefs had one, obviously, in the years that they've won it, which is three of the last, what, three of the last six or so. And so Mm -hmm. that's something to know. I mean, when you look at the other teams, the Rams also had an elite D tackle with Aaron Donald. That's uh, that's another player where you, you could kind of consider that. Uh, Tampa Bucks Bay had I mean, Vita Vea. They had Vita Vea. So yeah. maybe there's a different type of trend, you know, when you when you consider it. But definitely something to to note as well. Yeah, the Patriots were the one team that really didn't have anybody that I could look at. It was like flowers, like you know what I mean? Yeah, who, yeah. Who but went I mean, who went to the Lions and was like out of the league more. a year later? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. So basically what we're looking at, the 49ers, although they don't check all the boxes perfectly, they're they're in the wheelhouse. They're absolutely in the wheelhouse. And also, that's the previous six years. If I expand that to 10 years, I'm sure that all those things don't hold true as well. Right. But it was just interesting to look at because, again, it's it's easy to say and really lazy to say, all right, an elite quarterback, you have a chance. Well, yes, but there's more to it. It's a team game. And those are the things, really the top three were the most interesting to me. It's like, okay, 49ers have the quarterback. They definitely have the defensive players that can go all pro. And then they have the head coach that's lost the Super Bowl. Like, check, check, check. They're good to go. So the 49ers absolutely could win a Super Bowl this next year based off of those. Okay, let's get into this upcoming season before we get into the draft because these things are kind of going to parlay into the next topics. I've talked about this on the show. I believe I I first brought it up last Monday, but the 49ers have 39 players that are unrestricted free agents in 2025. As of now, that includes Brandon IU. Mm-hmm. The 49ers also tend to sign players late. So just because they we we're only hearing about IU, but that doesn't mean that guys like Diamond or Lenore or Traverius Ward or Banks or whoever are unrestricted free agents doesn't mean they're also not going to get signed at some point during the soft season. But if there are three guys, pick any yeah. three that you want to not let hit free agency, unrestricted free agency next off season, what three players would you like that to be for the San Francisco 49ers? So first off, I think I would have to go with the cornerback. Um, one that has been a, you know, the 49ers made an investment with early on in the draft. That's Ambry Thomas. So Thomas has been a guy who, you know, if you consider, I think he, he would be a guy who you extend. But no, uh, being being seriously uh, thinking about it, I mean, the clear one right now is Brandon Ayuk. He's a guy who I believe would get extended this offseason in the off chance that you expect uh, you, you see him play on the fifth year option. I don't think there's a chance San Francisco lets him leave. Um, but ultimately you expect that extension to happen at some point this off season. To me, I think the most intriguing position though is corner and for the other players at corner, Traverius Ward and Diameter Lenore. To me, it feels like you're going to be able to only extend one of those two players. It's hard to pay with the way the Niners have their, 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 their situation, especially with the amount of money they attribute to the defensive line. It seems like it'll be tough to pay two top tier contracts. I think the biggest question will be one. Where does Diameter Lenore fit? Do the Niners view him as a nickel or on the outside? How does Lenore want to be paid? Does he want to be paid as a nickel or the outside? And the second question, which is more of a cap situation type of thing, is that Traverius Ward has a void year in 2025 where his dead cap charge is around $12 million. I think with the, when the Niners went into this contract, they anticipated extending him one more time after giving him a three-year deal. And so that's why, to me, I personally believe the more realistic commitment would be Traverius Ward and letting Diamond or Lenore walk. But if you were to pick, they, you usually want the younger corner. Diamond or Lenore is several years younger. You at least get more years of his prime. So I'm going to go with the realistic option right now. So I'm going to go with Brandon Ayuk, Traverius Ward. And if you were to pick a third guy, I think there are a lot of intriguing names. I mean, I, I brought up Lenore. I'm going to bring up Jawan Jennings, Drake Greenlaw. I think that those are all guys that you can consider. Aaron Banks is also a part of the equation. I think out of everybody in the group um, that I just mentioned, I'd honestly go with Drake Greenlaw. I think he's going to come cheaper than you'd expect at linebacker after coming off this injury. I think he has the connection with uh, Fred Warner, and I th- think that that allows your defense to do a couple of intriguing things. What about you? Man, that's, I actually, hmm, this is tough. Ayuk, we agree with. We mm-hmm. completely agree with. Yeah. I I have to, uh, I think you're right that Traverius Ward is 
more realistic. But Diameter Lenore is younger and more yeah. versatile as well. I mean, this is a guy that can play inside or he can play out. I think also he could potentially fit that star role that Staley likes to run, which is a, a unique role. It's a tough role to fill. You're kind of like hybrid safety linebacker corner. I know he's a little bit smaller, but the way that he hits, the way that he covers, I feel like he could fit that a little bit if need be. I would prefer to keep Lenore. Plus, I think if you sign him this offseason, especially, you're going to get him for a really, for really sure. good deal. Much, yeah, much like you did with Dre Greenlaw. Remember how they signed Dre Greenlaw quietly after a bad game against the Bears week one just two short years ago? That signing was phenomenal. And, and people were upset at the time, like, oh my gosh, they should have extended, you know, it shouldn't have been Greenlaw. It should have been um, Aziz Al Shair. And, and a lot of frustration went into that. But ultimately, Dre Greenlaw getting extended for that price was an absolute steal, even though he's also coming off that injury. So I would say Diamador Lenore. And then just looking at the offensive line, I don't trust anything from the center over right now. Mm hmm. Really, Trent Williams could retire after this next season. Like, that's not too far fetched. If I lose Aaron Banks, also, I'm rebuilding the whole offensive line on the fly. Now, depending on what they do in the draft, that could rectify some of it. But as of right now, I'm looking at five players that if Aaron Banks goes, I don't trust any of them if Trent Williams retires. So I have yep, to go with Aaron awesome. Banks to help kind of anchor that offensive line. Plus, I don't think he's going to be that expensive either. But he's young. He's still developing. And I think he can be a really good player. I think he could be a multiple-time Pro Bowler. Not an All-Pro necessary, necessarily, but I do think he can be a Pro Bowler in this league. I think that you brought up great names. I want to say one thing. The Niners have a lot of potential free agents in 2025 because both mm -hmm. of us didn't even talk about Talano Hufanga, who's also a free agent in 2025. That just tells you the amount of players that might be involved the thing about Banks, I think you brought up a really good point, and I think the Niners could find a way to keep more players if they go with what you said, which is trying to figure out a way to extend some of these guys this season. We've already seen some of these markets try and increase. The corner market hasn't necessarily increased as much as you'd like, and if Lenore gets extended this offseason after a year where he played primarily in the nickel, you might get him at a nickel type of price, which is significantly cheaper than an outside type of price. And so that might be a way where you, you know, if you extend Lenore this year, you could find a way to keep both of your top corners and maybe not have to make as big of an investment in the position in the draft or somewhere else. Uh, but the other position at guard, I think that, you've seen the guard market start to boom. And I wonder two things. One, do the Niners value the position as much where they'd be willing to dish out a $10 million salary or more to a guy like Aaron Banks after, you know, they let Lake Tomlinson walk a few, uh, a few years ago, do they value this, uh, that position or will they prefer to get a comp three and then try and, uh, you know, go after the position in the draft once again for a cheaper solution. That's the big question to me. And two, how much will Banks ultimately command after, uh, you know, you see above average, average to above average guards starting to get above average to elite level salaries now. Yeah, I don't, you know, it's tough because the other thing is this, we may want to extend any number of these players, but this league is also a business. How many of these players are like, you know what? I know that you're getting a discount on me now. I'm just going to bet on myself. You you don't have the opportunity to extend me. It's It's much like, when Mosley walked a couple off seasons ago, everybody was upset and they're like, Oh my, he only got 6 million from the lions or whatever it was. Now, obviously that kind of proved to be a good signing. because he got injured, but that aside, a lot of people were frustrated. One thing you don't know though, is did he want to come be a 49er again? We, we yeah. can't guarantee that he may have wanted to go be a Detroit line. He may have wanted to go somewhere else. Maybe he wanted to kind of write his own history and, and not be a part of this team. So, yeah, you can look at the money and say, hey, it would be smart to sign X player now to save the money. But X player might look at it and be like, yeah, I'm going to bet on myself. Thanks, but no thanks. Unless you want to up that offer now and give me more guaranteed money or more years or whatever it is that makes them happy, they may want to bet on themselves on a one-year deal. And that makes it really hard to extend a guy like that. I, I definitely agree. I think that because like... It's similar to the IU situation where you know you, you're seeing now. It takes two sides to an extension or to one of these contracts starting to come together. I, there, there's a there are two sides. Like maybe a player like Diamond or Lenore believes that if he plays on the outside and plays as he expects to play, he might get 
five million per year more just because of the position value on as an outside corner. Obviously, there's financial things that come to it. Players obviously want guaranteed money as soon as possible. That's where extensions usually come into play. But I think that's a very good point that you bring up. Yeah, it makes it tough. You just don't know who wants what and when they want it. Well, now that we've brought up these unrestricted free agents, we kind of have to look at this draft and next year's draft as being super important, especially now that they're getting the first round picks back. Not only are players getting older, you know, you can look at guys like Kittle, CMC, who I know that he's only 28, but that's usually when the, the bottom starts to fall out a little bit on running backs. Trent Williams, we discussed. We talked about how almost every player in the secondary, other than Jair Brown, is going to be a free agent. So how do the 49ers future proof? Like, what are the air, most pressing needs in this draft? What are the players or position groups that they need to figure out and say, hey, we may have some weaknesses going forward into next year. It's not just about this year. What types of players and position groups do they need to be looking at in this draft, in your opinion? I think that's a you know a very good question and one the Niners probably have to contemplate, especially having a first round pick. I think this also highlights how bad the last two draft classes were for the Niners. Where if you look at that 2023 class where Brock Purdy really was the only guy to right now have a significant impact, Jair Brown was, uh, or sorry, the 2022 class where Brock Purdy really is the only guy where you had a significant impact. Yes, no first round pick hurts you there, but you'd hope to have a little bit more out of that draft class. 2023, Jair Brown looks solid, but if you're looking at initial, uh, you know, if you're looking at the initial impact, Cameron Latu was a red shirt as a as your second or third highest overall pick. Jake Moody, average to below average, se- well, below average season for a kicker. And that's a position where you don't really want to see development. You're you're not rely- relying on the development as much. And so this makes this draft even more crucial because you might need some starters as soon as next year, but you might need high-end starters to replace the high-end guys that you might be losing. I think the position everyone looks at is offensive tackle because of how this draft is. Offensive tackle, it's a significant group in the first round where as many as nine players could be considered as first round selections uh, as an offensive tackle with even more, you know, on the interior. But I think the offensive line as a whole, because like you said, if Trent retires, how much, how, how, will, how much are you relying on whoever else is remaining at the offensive line? Trent Williams is the reason this group is average to above average. You know, this group significantly decreases without a guy like Trent Williams. You might want to improve the remainder of that group. I think secondary is also a position where you might have to understand you might lose one of your top two guys. You might need to replace one of your top two guys. And then the position I'll also throw out there is receiver because we we're talking about Brandon Ayuk. I personally believe he gets extended, but Jawan Jennings is a free agent next year. Seems like he could get a good deal on the open market with the way receiver contracts are going, especially for a guy of his, you know, of his caliber. And then Debo Samuel could be potentially traded as a cap salary cap relief type of move um, with him obviously having a $24 million cap hit next year. That might mean you might need, you know, one to two guys to potentially step into those roles and ha- have an impact in 2025. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's interesting because offensive line is what's talked about a ton, but, when I started looking at the secondary, I said, hold on a second. So literally all three starting corners, at least as of now, right? we don't know if, if Ambry Thomas or Isaac Yadam, I assume one of them is going to be starting outside opposite of Ward. I assume Lenore is going to be starting as, as your nickel or your slot corner. So all three corners are going to be free agents. Then you've got Hafunga who's going to be a free agent. Really, it's Jair Brown. So four-fifths of that secondary is going to be free agents as of now yeah. next year. So all of a sudden you lo- you're looking at the secondary and saying, "Wow, I mean, that might be m- just as if not more crucial than the offensive line as far as future proof in this team." And if you get a really good corner early in this draft that can start right away, you've already upgraded a starting spot to where I look at the offensive line and say, "Okay, we all want offensive linemen." But what's the chance that one of these guys is going to come in right away and take a starting job? I don't know. I mean, that might be a little far-fetched. So I think secondary is going to be one. But let me ask you this. The 49ers haven't had maybe the best drafts the last couple of years. On the surface, looking at last year's draft, not a lot of people contributed. But they did draft two tight ends, which is a position of need still. They did draft two linebackers, which future proofing is 
a position of need. They drafted mm-hmm. another young wide receiver. They drafted another corner. Out of the players they drafted last year, could you see any of those guys potentially taking a leap in year two and and kind of helping solve the issue at hand here? I think uh, if you look at it, Brown is the guy who you anticipate would be a starter, um, especially after, you know, he had up and downs in his rookie year. At what role right now is unknown. People probably assumed he'd play the Hufanga role at some point after, uh, you know, Hufanga eventually became a free agent, but you might seem opposite of Hufanga. I mean, Ooh, is that is that my internet or is that his guys? Moody. It's his. I've a lot of. Oh. All right, here. We're going to let him go, log out, and then come back in. I think it's his internet. Pretty sure. There we go. We'll make him come back. I felt like it was his. Maybe maybe not. Rohan? Rohan? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, great comment. Great comment. Okay. Let's read a couple of the Super Chats while we're waiting for Rohan to come back. All right, Brother Bob says, who wouldn't want to play for Kyle Levy? Super Bowl winners. <laughs> All right, okay. Brother Bob also says, Rohan, B100, will Kyle Levy ever win a Super Bowl with the Niners? Okay, well, I've got to save that one for when he comes back. So we'll leave that there. What's good, TC? What's good? Okay. Well, while we're waiting for Rohan, I guess I'll give my answer. I, I do. I, I think that they're... I don't want to completely write off Willis. I think that there's an opportunity that he could be maybe a tight end two in this league. I know that the 49ers tend to look for pass-blocking tight ends or run-blocking tight ends, just blocking tight ends in general, to pair up with Kittle, but the end is near for Kittle. He's not going to be playing forever. They need to find somebody that can be a receiver as well. Preferably, you would get a guy that can do both like Kittle can. I'm not saying Willis is going to be amazing necessarily, but I think he can be decent in this league. I do think he can be a tight end number two in this league potentially. But really the guy for me that I think might help future-proof things, we talked about the linebacker position. Rohan himself said that he would maybe bring back Dre Greenlaw if he's future-proofing this team out of the three players that he would bring back. I wouldn't bring back Greenlaw. One, I don't know how he's going to perform off the injury. And I'm not saying I wouldn't bring him back at all, but I'm saying right now, if I had to sign three guys, Greenlaw wouldn't be on that list. And it's it, the injury is one of them, but also I really believe in Jalen Graham. I think he's going to be a, a very good player in this league. Maybe I'm completely off. It's not like I, I think I'm great at evaluating talent at the linebacker position but man when i look at all the boxes he checks for the 49ers you've got fred warner who was a safety converted to linebacker you've got greenlaw who was a safety converted to linebacker jalen graham safety converted to linebacker you watch him play during training camp he's a very headsy player he got his hands on the ball almost every practice it seemed like he was always near the football had himself a nice pick that I can remember on Brock Purdy during training camp last year. And he did a great job in the one-on-one drills, drills that are designed to make the offensive player be highlighted. So when I look at all of those things, I think Jalen Graham can be a very crucial player for the San Francisco 49ers as They are building going forward. So that's who I was going to bring up as a player that is on this roster now that we could be future proofing the roster with. I I think he's a player that can help them out and still be productive going forward that maybe hasn't been productive yet and alleviate some of the draft capital this year. Maybe the where they don't have to spend it on a linebacker because 
he can help fill that need. But make no mistake about it, the San Francisco 49ers have a lot of holes on this roster going forward with the 39 unrestricted free agents. Doesn't mean they can't bring some of these guys back, but it's going to be tough to bring back a majority of them just because of the salary cap situation. So hopefully a guy like Willis or Graham can kind of step up and help them future-proof this roster. All right, let's see if Rohan's back and ready to go. You good? Are we good? I can hear you. Are you good? You hear me? Yeah, yeah. I'm good. I'm good. We're okay. good. All right, perfect. That's what so happens when you're on the college Wi-Fi, so we're back. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Well, I was just saying that the player that I think can help the 49ers future-proof is Jalen Graham. You and I were very impressed with him in training camp last yeah. year. I know that I was watching more of the one-on-one -on -one drills than you were, but I remember him also picking off Brock Purdy in one of the practices. I thought he did great during the one-on-one -on -one drills. I think that he could be a future starter for the San Francisco 49ers at the linebacker position. Even if Dre Greenlaw walks, I really could see him stepping into that role potentially. So maybe it's more of a hope, but he's a guy that was a safety, converted to linebacker. We know that's something the 49ers have had success with in Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw. Maybe he could be that next guy up. Do you see any hope for Jalen Graham, or do you think I'm just off my rocker and completely overhyping this guy? No, I, I think that you can definitely make the argument, right? If you talk about Jalen Graham initially pre-draft, everyone's talking about, oh, 464 speed, maybe not the gre greatest, but you could see he moves well sideline to sideline. He's a guy who might potentially fill in that role, maybe not a Mike linebacker in the future, but he's a guy who, you know, you, you want as a second, third linebacker. He's a guy who could fit in that role. Obviously, we don't have much film. We, we have practice film. That's primarily it uh, to, to evaluate these guys in the NFL. But I think that Jalen Graham could be that type of guy. D. Winters, he's a bit smaller. He's more faster. You might consider him more of a special teamer type of guy. But Jalen Graham, I, I, I think you can definitely see you're going to try and give both of those guys opportunities if Greenlaw's not there during training camp. We'll see kind of if one of them can emerge for sure. Yeah, and Brother Bob had a question for you. I wanted to save it. He said, Rohan, B100, do you think Kyle Levy will ever win a Super Bowl with the 49ers? <laughs> That's funny. Because Grant actually asked this question the other day. I, I personally do believe that this I, I do believe it'll happen. I and this is me kind of sticking with the prediction that I made a, a you know a season or two ago. Now, again, this is me also saying I did not believe the Niners would win a Super Bowl last year. A lot of people thought they were ultimately that was going to be the hump. I also thought that could have been their best potential chance. But I didn't think that they were going to ultimately win the Super Bowl. Obviously, that didn't happen. I but I think I'd be you know, remiss to not say that they also have as good of an opportunity this year. If you look at the NFC, it's pretty clear the Niners are probably the favorites in the NFC again. I think that you know, with the amount of chances they should get, one should at least break where they ultimately win a Super Bowl. Do you think it's on the, on the surface, is it going to be tougher to win this year than it was last year? I mean, it's easy to say knowing how far they made it last year, but just looking at the teams that were in the NFC last year, maybe the Chiefs were down more than what they had been in previous years. Do you think it's going to be harder this year as far as the teams they're going to have to go through? Absolutely. I, I do think it'll be harder. Now, again, when, when you consider harder, you also have to consider that the Niners still have as good of a roster as they had, and they can beat tougher teams. But mm -hmm. the reason I thought last year was their best chance is because when you look at their primary opponent, Kansas City, Kansas City was at its worst last year. You know, they were revamping, retooling that roster. Not really. Rashi Rice, a rookie, was their number one receiver. You had Kelsey coming off a bit of a down year, going into a bit of a down year, you know. You had probably the best infrastructure to beat that type of team. This year, the Chiefs have a chance to get better because every time they get a first-round pick or every time they have a chance to improve that roster with younger talent, they're going to be able to get better. I think that's the way that I look at it. So it's going to be tougher. But I do think the Niners still have a good roster where on their best day, they can beat some of those better teams. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the AFC is Texans are going to be tough, but uh, same thing as last year. They only have to beat one AFC team in the playoffs. The NFC is what they have to get through. They should still be the favorite, although I think the Lions have definitely improved this offseason, at least on paper. I think the Packers have improved. On paper, everybody talks about the running back swap, but really they got one of the, one of the better safeties in the league 
added to that roster. That was massive. You look at the offensive linemen they lost, everybody's like, oh, those are big names. Yes, they're big names, but they really didn't play for them last year at all. I mean, they were out all year. So it's not like they lost anything there. They lost the name, but those guys weren't contributing anyway. So I think the Packers have gotten better. Packers tend to also draft pretty well. So we'll see. I mean, a young roster, you expect them to all develop and improve. That's the the case with their quarterback and receivers. Yeah. Good point. Very, very good point. Okay. Well, we don't know how these teams are going to draft, but what we can do is we can kind of look at recent history. We're, we're going to look at the history of each draft pick through the first three rounds that the 49ers have. I believe it's 31, 63, and 94. And we're going to look at the players picked at those spots and see if there's any hope for getting good players here in this upcoming draft. Guys that can contribute right away at the very least. So hopefully everybody can see this. So at pick 31, these are the players that have been selected in the Shanahan era. Obviously, the 49ers had one of these picks. We remember Ruben Foster. That didn't go well. Sony Michelle was a nice player for the Patriots. Won a Super Bowl. We, we just talked about that a little bit earlier, how he was the running back on one of the Super Bowl teams. So he was a good player for the Patriots, but recently retired, I believe, as well. Was never special, but a good player. Caleb McGarry, I, I think is probably the best player on this list as far as production goes. Very good offensive lineman for the Falcons. Not elite by any means, but beyond a serviceable. He's he's solid. Solid enough. He's solid. Okay, there we go. He's better than Colton McKivitz, would you say? I would say he's better than Colton McKivitz. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the name that obviously is going to stand out for me is uh, my boy Ruben Foster. You know, um, that was probably the Niners' best pick at number 31 in recent history. Yeah, great. great. (laughs) Nice, nice. But what else stands out to you on on this list? Any surprises? Um, Just anything that you're looking at saying, okay, this is a trend I'm seeing. What what do you think about the overall players at at draft pick 31 in the last, what, seven years or so? Yeah. I think you see a bit of a trend, you know, as the years go along. You look at Sony Michelle. Your teams rarely now draft a running back in the first round. Mm. You don't expect the Niners or a team in general to probably draft one in this class with a weaker running back class. Caleb McGarry was an offensive tackle. Usually that's kind of in a stronger offensive tackle range. That could be similar to the 2024 class where there's a significant amount of offensive tackle talent. But then after that, defense, 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 defense. There's four defensive players, two defensive ends, and two secondary players, you know? So if you're looking, those are kind of the positions where you might expect specifically in this draft for the Niners to go because defensive end, if someone falls at 31, the Niners are a team who usually like to take those type of players. You could be, you could consider that secondary. That's going to be a big need in 2025. You're probably losing at least one, maybe even two of the top three players that are going to be free agents. And then, I mean, you can consider offensive tackle as well, where the Niners also might look to consider that position given how deep it is in the first round of this class as well. Yeah. Looking just overall, looking at the talent here, a little bit disappointing, right? Because we're looking at 31, like, yeah, we finally got a first round pick back. It's like, Oh, but it's pick 31, at least recent history. I mean, you can get some guys, right? Caleb McGarry, I do think is the best player on this board. Yeah. I think he's, an above average offensive lineman. He's not special by any means, but he's a good player. And if the 49ers got a Caleb McGarry type of player, I I wouldn't be that mad at it. Actually, I think he would be just fine. Gladney has been a starter for the Vikings, not special by any means, but he has been starting in this league. Adafi Owe, he's a guy who's been a spot starter, decent sacks for the Baltimore Ravens and, and spot duty. Dax Hill starter for Cincinnati this year, decent, but it's still early. And then uh, Anadike Uzama really didn't play much at all for the Chiefs this right. last year. So if you're looking for a guy to be in an immediate impact, the only guy that really stands out on here is McGarry. And the nice thing is he's an offensive lineman and the 49ers could definitely yeah. use an offensive lineman. So if that trend continues, maybe that's the route that the 49ers would want to go. Yeah, and I mean, I think if you get, like you said, if you get a McGarry-type player, you're going to be pretty happy if that's the guy 
or that type of guy that you come out of in this draft. You know, I know a lot of people didn't like Mike McGlinchey. I'd consider him an average offensive tackle. Um, but if you get like, you know, in, in somewhere in the average to above average range and a guy who's a little more consistent, that's good enough to where you can have that one position solidified for five years, especially in this offense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I mean, if I looked at pick 32 and 30, like guys around that area, I'm sure that there's some good players that we could pull from there. But specifically right. at pick 31 last seven years hasn't been great. This is what I found interesting, though. We get to pick 63. Some really good players at pick 63. I would almost mm -hmm. take this crop of players at pick 63 over the guys at 31. I mean, wh what do you think? <laughs> do you agree with that? I mean, I think you would definitely consider it. And uh, I, I, there's one team that consistently just is on the page, which is the Chiefs. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. They've hit. They've hit on these picks. They're yeah. good players. Yeah. But I mean, but literally like Deion, 80 percent of these players are good. That's what I'm saying. Deion Dawkins, hell of a player, right? Carlton Davis mm -hmm. just got traded. He's looking to be the number one over with Detroit. Thornhill. Gay, they're good players. Creed Humphrey, absolute dog in this league. James Cook started to come on very strong for the Buffalo Bills this last year. Marvin Mims, maybe not so much. But the rest of them, and it's still only you know one year in for Mims, but the rest right. of them, this is pretty good. This is actually really encouraging. I was shocked. I had to like double check. Like, Am I looking? Is this 31 and the other one was 63? Had to do a little bit of a back and forth, but truly... These players at 63 are very, very good players. And I really think if I just took this crew versus that crew, I, I would take these guys. I, I would prefer these guys over the other. Yeah. And I mean, if you're looking at a trend, the difference, I think, especially, and I, I haven't seen the 94 one, but I think if you're looking at a similar range, it's a lot more variety, right? You're, you have an offensive lineman, you have a corner, you have a safety, you have a linebacker, you have a center. You have a running back, you have a receiver, that's seven different positions, you know, where you get a lot more variety. And the reason that I say that is when you looked at the last one, you might consider those as more premium positions, especially as you go along, you know, uh, corner, that's a premium position in today's NFL DN. That's a premium position in today's NFL. And then obviously offensive line, offensive tackle specifically, that's a premium position in today's NFL. Whereas as you go later in the draft, a lot of teams tend to, you know, for some reason, tend to choose more best player available. Just as, you know, the needs start to fill up more and more, you get to go with a best player available. And that's where you, most teams tend to make some of their best selections, the Niners included. And so it's an intriguing trend for sure. And one you can clearly see on this page. Yeah, absolutely. So this was encouraging to see. Very, very happy with this. Maybe the 49ers are going to get a steal at 63. And let's go to the third round pick, 94. I'll let you take this one. What stands out to you here? Yeah, I mean, you got a couple of cool players, you know, a couple of uh, maybe not so great players. Matt Corral, obviously, the ones that stands out as a guy who isn't with his team anymore. But Cam Sutton, I mean, regardless of what he's going through right now, good player, solid corner, starting level corner. Uh, Kappam, he's a starting level guard. He got a four year, $40 million contract. That's what you want out of a guard. Um, you know, who, who's in the third round, Jamel Dean starting level corner Deguara, not great Cleveland average level guard, you know, average level offensive lineman. And then Michael Wilson, he had his flashes. So you definitely see a couple of players on this list that you can also be excited about. Maybe not the same level of the 63 guys, but starters who you can get in the third round is the main thing that I can take away out of this. Well, and the 49ers have pulled some good players out of the third round. Like, as long as they're not drafting kicker or tight end, apparently, they might be pretty good in the third round, right? We we just got a starter last year that we looked at. We talked about future proof in the team. Well, the one right. the one guy who's not a free agent should be a starter for the 49ers for a while, and that's Brown, third round pick. Right. So you can definitely pull some talent in round number three. And there's there's some guys on here. What I'm looking at in round number three, I'm not necessarily looking for a superstar, although if you get one, that's great. But kind of like when we go back to the round one, the best we could really say is, hey, there's you know three guys on this list that are starters for teams. If you can get that in round three, if you can get a guy who can start for you for four or five years, I'm happy with that. That's great production for a third round pick, in my opinion. I agree. And I want to throw one question at you kind of as we look at these three charts. 
What is your expectation out of this draft in terms of starters, but also contributors in year one? Do you expect your first round pick to potentially contribute in year one? Are you when you when you talk about future proofing, are you okay with maybe your 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 primary class being main contributors next year? What's kind of your mindset as you go into this trying to try and get starters or you know quality players for this class for the future? Well, that's an interesting question. And the reason I find it interesting is because I had that, you know, when we were going the last six teams to win a Super Bowl, that was one of the things that I had on there is they all had a rookie that contributed. But when I sec when I went through to second check it, the one team that didn't fit that criteria was the Rams. Now remember the Rams, they were F them picks for a while. So they had some good players that were like year two players, like three guys that started that were previous draft picks mm -hmm. from the year prior, but nobody that was a rookie contributor. But if you look at the Chiefs, consistently bringing, bringing in guys that are rookie contributors, obviously we saw that with the Patriots throughout their dynasty. And even the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they drafted Tristan Wirfs that year. So they all right. had rookies that were contributors. And so, yeah, I would expect, maybe it's not even the round one guy, but hopefully in the first three rounds, they can get a guy that will contribute in a big way this year. And really, we look at the 49ers last year. They did have that guy last year, and it was Brown. And if they had won a Super Bowl, we mm -hmm. could then add them to that list of, hey, you had a rookie that contributed. I would expect with a first-round pick again that in the first three rounds, they get a guy who does contribute in a big way at some point this season, whether through injury or just as an outright starter coming out of training camp. I would expect that. What about you? No, I, I think you expect it as well. You'd hope that at least one of the top three picks would contribute, especially having your first round pick finally. It's not like your first three picks are second, third, fourth, or third, third, fourth, or something like that. You have three right. picks, you know, in the first three rounds. So you'd hope at least one of them contributes. You can have a, a plan for 2025 where you might maybe with one of those picks select a developmental guy, but I think you do want a contributor at least, at least one in the top three rounds for this upcoming year. Yeah, most certainly. Let me get this overlay back on. Let's read the super chat real quick. Kent says, which positions should the Niners address first in the draft to improve this year? This kind of is, is similar to the question you asked. What are the top two or three missing pieces? Well, we can go spot for spot. I mean, the obvious one is, is offensive linemen. Um, what, what other, what other positions do you see where there could be a potential starter or a missing starter if you're looking at the roster going into the draft? I think the one other one that you would say that you brought up earlier is corner. Maybe if you bring in another piece, be it at nickel or on the outside that could compete with Isaac Yanam or even, mm -hmm. you know, allow Lenore to move to the outside, that'd probably be the other position that I'd kind of consider as well. Yeah, I would I would look at that. I also think that safety could be up for grabs. I know that we all like Hafunga, but him and Brown are very similar. They don't have a true free safety, a guy that can roam, in my opinion. There are some guys in this draft. Yes, there are some guys early that we could look at, but even in round three, I believe that there's going to be some guys that fall that potentially could fit that role and compete as well. Not necessarily because they're better players right away than a Hafunga, but maybe they just fit the team. Oh, there he goes again. And he's gone. Hold on, let me pull this off. But maybe players that just fit the team and fit better with Jair Brown. I think that that's a possibility. You go get a player that fits better with Jair Brown or even Huff. Maybe you want to sit Jair Brown for a year and allow Huff to be the starter. I think that those guys exist this this year as well. And then as much as I I just talked up <laughs> I just talked up one of the players from last year's draft and Jalen Graham. If they go get a linebacker, I could see a linebacker potentially contributing this year as well. So I don't know. I, I don't think that any position. I, I'll say this. Every position has depth. I don't know that every position has a for sure. A for sure like a front line starter, starter type of thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and there's obvious ones, right? Like obviously Christian McCaffrey is going to start. Obviously Brock Purdy, Brandon IU, Kittle, the, there's obvious starters on the team. I understand that, but there are definitely positions where there are starters or even starters from last year that you go, uh, I could see a player coming in and taking their job potentially. And I think that there's multiple spots on this team. 
So I will, we'll see. I will say this one thing in addition to that, that I think that resonates with what you're saying in the sense that I don't know how big of a fan I was of what the Niners did overall in free agency. I think they made some good moves. The one thing mm. I wanted was a center, which they ultimately didn't go get. But the one thing that I will say that they did really well, they addressed the quote unquote holes on this team. Whereas you can truly go best player available in the draft and be content with whoever you select in the first round, I feel in this upcoming class. Yeah, most certainly. But, you know, center, speaking of center, we're, we're stuck looking at tackles and guards and what have you. Center is something that Shanahan called the heartbeat of his offense. Well, if it's the heartbeat of the offense, it's weird that you have a guy like Jake Brendel starting yet again. But center is a player that you can get or a position that you can get in this draft at pick 31 and get probably an elite one going forward. So if that's the route they want to take, maybe BPA is a center and that could help and contribute this year. So certainly. And especially if you can get a guy who they like, you know, one of those guard center versatile type of guys that usually they try and go for maybe a Duke's Graham Barton. I think that, you know, they'd probably be pretty happy with that type of idea. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's talk about draft day trades. So we just looked at the players that have been selected recently at pick 31. So I have a question for you. Should the 49ers stand pat? Now, you don't know who's going to be there. As the draft approaches and on draft day, we're going to do a draft stream together. You, myself, David, probably or hopefully Marco is going to be a part of that as well. But we may look at it and be like, oh, they got to trade up now. They got to go get this guy. But just looking at how mock drafts have been going, looking at the players at, at pick 31 that have been drafted recently, do you believe the 49ers should stand pat? trade up or trade back on the surface right now at the combine because i was able to go i was pretty steadfast with my opinion if the 49ers specifically wanted one of the top offensive tackles that were going to be worthy of a first round pick it was my belief that they would need a trade up mm. i think my opinion on that has lightened a little bit but also due to the fact that i don't think offensive tackle is the only position that you should feel that you need to take at 31 I think with the idea where you can go best player available, it opens your eyes to other possibilities, maybe, uh, you know, decreases the need for a trade up. With that said, though, I do believe the Niners have enough arsenal or enough, you know, in their arsenal to execute a trade up. If you talk about their, 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 their draft picks, they've got three fourth round draft picks um, at 124, 132, and 135 that they could use to execute in a trade up. You've seen a couple of these you know, trades where you might go up from 31 to maybe 25, 26 with a fourth round pick. The Niners have that in this class, especially. And there are some teams, you know, in the first round where you look at it and you can see that they might want capital in the day three selections where they don't have it as much. And so I could very well see a trade up. The one thing I've warmed up to a little more nowadays is a trade down though as well because mm. the Niners are at 31 that's a premium position for teams looking to trade up into the first round to get that fifth year option could be for a quarterback could be for a premium position where you want that fifth year option the Niners don't necessarily always need that it depends on the player and you also might get a premium for that certain selection so I think that that's something that the Niners could also entertain if they feel that there's a number of players on their board they'd be comfortable with taking yeah, I'm just looking at, and obviously draft day, things can completely change, but I don't like standing put right now. That's that's not, that would definitely be number three on my list. Trading up would be awesome, but I love trading back as well because what I think that allows them to do is get more capital. And I don't necessarily think that if they pick up another draft pick that they should draft 12 guys this year. But what that does allow them to do, if they go back five, six spots, you can still get a very good player but that allows them to be aggressive, aggressive with maybe pick 94 to move back up into the second round. Maybe in round three, they decide, or I mean, uh, not pick 94, but 63 to move up further into the second round and package some of those picks, 94 if they want to move up th further, or even take one of those fourth round picks and package it with other things and move back up into the late third round as well. I think that gives them flexibility to be aggressive and go get a guy they really, really want later in the draft as well, whether that's round two, three, or four, however they see fit. So that's what I like about trading back is just gaining assets and allowing yourself to be fluid throughout the draft and say, okay, now we have enough assets where we could trade up one, maybe even two more times 
and go get guys that we're targeting later on in this draft because everybody has different sleepers. Everybody has different positions of need. But when you look at it, it's like really even the first round doesn't ever go the way that you expect it to go. But as the draft goes, I know that there's been a million times, man, that McDonald's internet is killing him today. But I know that there's been a million times where it seems like, man, this player is available. You got to go get him now. And then your favorite team passes on him, in our case, the 49ers. But I've seen it with, with other content creators and the drafts that they've had as well, where you get frustrated that a player gets passed on. But ultimately, your favorite team is looking at a different player. And that allows the 49ers to be flexible, go and get a guy that they want, they prefer and fill out the rest of their roster. So that's what I would like about a trade back is it just gives them that flexibility as the draft goes on to trade back up as they see fit. All right, let me make sure I didn't miss anything. I see you guys. <laughs> uh, they're killing you for your Wi-Fi. This is funny. All right, more bacon. Nice, nice. You guys are great. All right, Rohan is there. Oh, there he goes again. He's out. All right, y'all, listen, <laughs> we made it through the show. At least I made it through the show, Last Man Standing style. Thank you for Rohan for joining me tonight. I know that people are over on his channel watching. Sorry, if you tuned in to see Rohan, you saw more of me, unfortunately. But for the rest of you, I will be back tomorrow with Sunil. And until tomorrow, peace. <laughs>